Siri, why don't you understand me? My understanding of your language is still somewhat imperfect. My apologies. Computer hardware seems so complex. I mean, if a child were to ask you to describe how your car worked, you could probably give a pretty reasonable answer that would be, for the most part, true. We can kind of understand how a car works, at least sort of at a basic level. But if that same child were to come up and ask how your smartphone worked, or how your tablet worked, or how your laptop worked, you would just look at them and say, it's magic. Throughout human history, whenever we haven't understood something, we usually just say it's magic. And there's some truth to the idea that computer hardware is complex. I mean, we keep finding new ways of putting more and more hardware into smaller and smaller packages. And something that started out simple just became more complex because somebody saw it and said, well, maybe I could make it just a little bit better. And then somebody took that thing and said, well, I think I could make it just a little bit better. It could do more. I could make it faster. I could do whatever. And we kept improving this thing in an iterative process, version after version. And we've been doing that since the Second World War. And because of that, what we have now is really, really complex, but based on the same fundamental ideas that we started with back in the 1930s and 40s. Computer textbooks often try to classify computer hardware into one of four or five categories. Almost all of them include input, output, processing, and storage. Input hardware allows you to insert data into the computer using your hands or voice or something like that, right? Think keyboards and mice and microphones. Whereas output hardware usually takes the digital binary data stored inside the computer and finds a way to represent it in something that makes sense to you as a human. Think uh, the images on your computer monitor or the sounds that come out of your speakers. Storage hardware allows you to save and store files like your music collection or all the movies that you've got or maybe uh, all the term papers you wrote in college. Those sorts of things would be stored on devices like maybe USB flash drives or the hard drive inside your computer. Processing hardware moves data from place to place within the machine and performs operations on it like adding or multiplying or any one of a number of different operations that you can perform on data. Um, when you think of a processing piece of hardware, generally you're thinking of the processor itself, right? Your CPU, uh, something made from Intel or AMD. The problem with trying to classify all of this hardware is that the lines kind of get fuzzy between certain devices. So while the monitor that displays the images from inside your computer is probably definitely an output device, the graphics card that's used to actually convert that data from some sort of binary representation into digital video signal well, that sort of lives in both worlds. It's an output device, but it's also a processing device. And, and these are the sorts of fuzzy lines that we get into when we try to classify things. I mean, almost every device that we have nowadays has a touch screen on it. A touch screen is both an output and an input device. Now, if you want to get technical, you could always say that, well, it's technically an output device that has an overlay of a thin, transparent input device that registers your touch. Some textbooks even add a fifth category called communication devices. Others would say that that's just an example of an output and an input device in one, sort of a special case. But regardless, all of this categorization doesn't really add a whole lot of value to you as a potential employee. What adds value is you knowing how to effectively use the hardware. How we use computers and how we use the technology around us is quite important. For that reason, I'm going to focus on the first two categories, input and output hardware. And I'm not going to focus on the categories themselves, but rather the function of that hardware, which is how we interact with computers, how we interact with technology. Because that's where we're seeing a lot of the big changes over the last 10 years. It's not necessarily in how the machines work. It's in how we interact with the machines. And that's actually kind of a fascinating study. It's a whole field called human, com human computer interaction, HCI. Um, and a lot of companies are spending a lot of money doing research and developing new and better ways for us to actually interact with the devices that are all around us. In fact, there's been a lot of acknowledgement in engineering circles that engineers may be part of the problem. Uh, the kind of person who's attracted to the field of engineering is somebody who's often attracted to things that are complex. They prefer and favor complexity. 
And there's a lot of value to complexity. Complexity allows you to do more. I mean, just compare the view from your driver's seat in your car, looking at the dashboard, to the cockpit of a 747. There's a lot more buttons and switches and dials and levers in that airplane cockpit, but they need to be there because planes are just more complex than automobiles. The problem is that when these engineers start creating devices that are meant for the general public, the general public generally doesn't prefer complexity. They prefer simplicity. They like machines that just do what they're supposed to do, that are very simple to interact with, and this becomes sort of a problem. And in recent years, a lot of companies have spent money developing their research in human-computer interaction and the way that we interact with machines because companies that have done that and created simple devices with simple interfaces have done very well in the market. At the, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about profit. Companies that design machines around human beings tend to be more profitable than companies who design machines and expect the human to adapt their behavior to use the machine. In order to do that, that means you first have to study human beings and how we interact with the world around us the ways we naturally prefer to interact with things that aren't technology. And then take that knowledge and somehow use it, adapt it into creating machines which might be very, very complex, but that allow us to interact with them very simply. And this is one of the great things of engineering. It turns out it's a lot harder to engineer a product that's simple to use than it is to engineer a product that's hard to use. It's harder to take all of that research and put it into a product that you can touch or talk to. And those are the two big trends in computers over the last 10 years. The rise of touch interfaces, allowing us to touch our devices and interact with them in that way, and the sort of beginning trend of voice recognition and natural language processing, which may eventually allow us to control the machines around us simply by telling them what we want them to do. We'll start with the touch interface because it's the one you probably have the most experience with. Pr practically every smartphone and tablet out on the market today has some sort of touch interface, something that allows you to actually touch and manipulate objects on the screen using your fingers or a stylus. I mean, if you look at a child, right? Even at four months old, they begin to start to try to manipulate the world around them using their hands and fingers, right? That's very natural for human beings. And it's one of the reasons why you can take a tablet and hand it to a five-year-old and they can open up games and they can do stuff and download things and probably get into more trouble than they really should. It's because the device is so easy and intuitive for them to, to use. So the other big way that we interact with our world sort of naturally is through our voice. It's something that we start developing as children, understanding language. But it turns out to be a really complex thing. And computers are not very good at it right now. But they're getting better and scientists are spending a lot of time and companies are spending a lot of money perfecting the idea of voice recognition and natural language processing, which are actually two different things. So voice recognition is the first task. That's the computer actually recognizing the words that you're saying, right? Taking the sound waves, literally, you know, the, the sounds that are coming from your mouth and translating them into text that the computer can then parse and try to understand some meaning from. Um, and this is, turns out to be difficult. I mean, one, just converting sound waves into words is kind of a difficult process. But once you get past that, you have the problem that humans have accents. We all say words in slightly different ways, and the computer has to kind of adapt for that and adjust. But we also have words that sound exactly the same, but they have completely different meanings. And so you have to take the word and sort of capture the context in which that word is being said. When I say rain, do I mean the leather straps that are attached to a, a horse? Do I mean precipitation, water that's falling from the sky? Am I saying the first name of Rain Wilson, one of the stars of the office? I mean, that word has multiple meanings, and we just have to know which word we're referring to by the context in which that word is said. Still, converting sound waves into words is easy compared to the next step, which is natural language processing. Once we have the words, now we have to try and understand what you're saying. Right? Not the actual words, but the meaning of the words. 
and trying to find some context to actually do something with those words. I mean, when you think about it, language is sort of a living thing. It's constantly changing. It has different meanings and there's wordplay and double meanings and there's a lot of complexity. Now, our brains are very good at figuring out the gist of things. And when somebody talks, you can generally ignore half of what they're saying and still get the gist of what they're saying. But computers are remarkably terrible at getting the gist of anything. But computer scientists are hard at work developing systems that actually can process natural languages. And the way they're doing it is kind of interesting, right? They're actually using artificial intelligence to create systems that try to understand patterns in natural language. And the way that they learn is by example, right? By talking to it and it trying to say, I think this is what you mean. And then we provide feedback. No, that's not true. Yes, that is true. The computer is literally learning through repetition and through feedback, which when you think about it, is kind of how you learned language. A great example of one of these systems was developed by IBM and is called Watson. Now, Watson is a bank of computer servers that all work together as one system, one machine. And what it does is it learns natural language and natural language patterns. And it's been trained over years to sort of understand these things. And it was designed to do a task that may seem a little frivolous. It was designed to play the game Jeopardy. Now, why would you choose Jeopardy, right? The reason is because Jeopardy is filled with double word meanings and word play and very intricate language, right? Jeopardy is a game that is kind of complex for even humans to play. And yet, we're trying to design a machine that can actually hear the, the, you know, the questions and give appropriate answers. Um, and it turns out IBM actually did put Watson into a game of Jeopardy and it played against two like sort of very famous Jeopardy champions, uh, Brad Rutter and Ken Jennings. And the result was kind of interesting. Beatles people for 200. And anytime you feel the pain, hey, this guy, refrain, don't carry the world upon your shoulders. Watson. Who is Jude? Yes. Olympic oddities for 200. Milorad Kavic almost upset this man's perfect 2008 Olympics, losing to him by one hundredth of a second. Watson. Who is Michael Phelps? Yes. Go. Name the dead. Now, if a machine can play Jeopardy, well, that's one thing. But if it can play Jeopardy, that also means that it could probably understand you. And it could probably understand that legal document that you need to sign. And it could probably understand every article that's been written in a medical journal over the last year, and then take that information and give it back to doctors when they ask questions like, you know, here are the, my patient's symptoms. What do you think it is, Watson? I mean, it's a system that has a lot of potential, um, but it's also a great example of a new way in which we can interact with the machines around us, just using natural language and our voice. Now, part of me likes talking about this sort of stuff because I'm a bit of a sci-fi geek, and I love the idea of living in a future where I can say, computer, tea, Earl Grey, hot, and it knows that it should make me a cup of tea, right? That's probably not gonna happen anytime soon. Uh, but I think it speaks to a big trend in engineering and a big trend in technology and computers, which is developing systems that have adapted themselves to the way that humans naturally interact, as opposed to act, asking the human to behave in an unnatural way, to try to mold the human for the machine versus doing the opposite, which is harder to do. It's harder to engineer a machine that can, you know, interact with a human on the human's terms. But there's money to be made in it, and so we know companies are going to be doing it. Computers are more intuitive and easy to use, that they have interfaces that make sense, that you can ask them a question if you don't understand. Computer, what button do I push to boldface? I mean, that's a possibility, and it's a possibility that's not, you know, millennia away. It's something that may happen in Windows 9, right? It's, it's in the near future for us. Computers and technology that are easier to use, easier to understand, um, and much more accessible to a larger group of people. And here's to a future 
of computers that are easier to use and technology that's a lot less frustrating. It's nice to note that iterative process of making things better, little by little, step by step, is still going on. And that in the future, things are still getting better. Wait a minute. If computers get really easy to use, then you won't need to take this class, and I might be out of a job. <laughs>